do. This morning's uh, Bible reading is from Genesis chapter 6. We're going to start in chapter 6, verse 8, and read all the way over through chapter 7, verse 16. It's Genesis chapter 6, starting with verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. Chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household. For you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and the animals that are not clean too, a male and his female. Also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights. And I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Noah did according to all the, the Lord had commanded him. Now Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood, of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and everything that creeps on the ground. There went into the ark to Noah to, by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. It came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open, and rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by two of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered male and female of all flesh entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. This is the word of the Lord. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the revelation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that's uh, given in your word, that we would, could know you, that we could uh, know ourselves, O oh Lord God. You who created us have uh, decreed these things and, and put them in your word. Lord, as uh, our pastor comes forth to unpack these scriptures, we pray that 
that you would be with him, O Lord God. Give him the words to speak. Open our eyes and our ears uh, to be able to read your word and hear your word uh, as it's being preached, O Lord. Um, and that we pray that uh, you would be glorified and that we would be greatly edified uh, by the words brought forth by our pastor this morning. It's in the blessed name of Christ that we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we are going to be in the book of Genesis for a few more weeks, and then we're going to take some holiday uh, break from Genesis and do some Thanksgiving sermons and also some Advent devotions. And then in um, January, we have a special guest speaker that's going to uh, speak to us. He, he looks like Moses and speaks like Moses and leads EY2S. And then we'll pick up our Genesis studies in February. So with that, let's look at the book of Genesis here, Genesis here this morning. We all know the story of Noah and the flood and the ark in Sunday school. You've seen cute little pictures. And this is, this is a cute picture. But unfortunately, when we see pictures like this, it, it makes us think that there is no way that this could have actually happened. It's a fairy tale, it's a myth, it's a legend, but it didn't really happen. And so we need to set those cute little pictures aside and look at the biblical text and see what actually happened. I believe, according to the scriptures, that this is literal history. And you should too, and you have every good reason to do that. In the Bible, Noah and the flood are... Uh, referred to by Jesus and the disciples. They referred to Noah as a historical figure and the account of the flood as a historical narrative. So with that, we're going to look at the portion of Scripture that uh, Brother Chris just read. We'll look at the, the faith of Noah, the obedience of Noah, and the message that Noah delivered to that antediluvian group, that means the pre-flood people, the faith of Noah. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The, the Hebrew word there is uh, ken, and it means favor or grace. Noah got grace. How were people under the old covenant saved? Well, they were saved the same way that people are under the new covenant, by grace through faith. Apart from works, there's a misunderstanding that somehow the old covenant was a covenant of works. People had to work for their salvation. No, sir. It's impossible for us to do anything to save ourselves because we know that all of our works are imperfect. Isaiah uh, says, the Lord says through Isaiah, your, your righteous deeds. In other words, the best things you do are like filthy rags compared to God's holiness. And so we cannot be saved by our works. There has to be another way, and that is by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, By grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So Noah was righteous. How is it that he could be called righteous? The same way that you are called righteous. There are two types of righteousness that we've talked about in this church repeatedly in our studies. There's positional righteousness, and then there's practical righteousness. A positional righteousness is imputed to you on the basis of faith. Noah was an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So when you put these two side by side, positional and practical righteousness, we see the difference, and yet both are necessary. A, a positional righteousness is imputed to the believer on the basis of faith. It's the righteousness of Christ reckoned to the account of the believer on the basis of faith. It happens at a point in time you're justified, you're declared holy because of the righteousness of Christ in you when you receive Christ by faith. 
And it's a forensic term. It's a legal term. It happens at a point in time. It's a direct declaration of, of the judge declared holy on the basis of that faith. Practical righteousness is imparted over time. It doesn't happen at a point in time. Boy, I wish it did. I wish that when I received Christ, I became this sinlessly perfect, holy dude. But you know, that doesn't happen. We still sin after we receive Christ. But for those that are in Christ, hopefully you're growing in godliness. Is that true for you? If you look back a year ago or five years ago, can you see a, a change in your Christian life? I hope that you're growing in godliness. That is practical righteousness. Whereas positional righteousness is, is the root of your salvation. That's why you're going to heaven. Um, practical righteousness is the fruit that is the naturally produced fruit of a person that's actually saved. We read that we're declared righteous, Romans 5, 1, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, but at the same time, we're becoming righteous. So in our position, we're declared righteous by justification. In our practice, we're becoming more and more righteous. We're called a new creation in Christ at the point of salvation, and yet daily, we're being renewed. So we have these two pieces, these two sides of righteousness. We read in Genesis that sin shall not be our master. We're to master sin. We do master sin by grace. And yet daily, I have to exert some effort into overcoming the sins in my life. We're called saints. That's our position. That, that's a pretty heavy duty uh, thing to own up to, you know. St. Jeff. <laughs> yes, we should genuflect before you. Um, you're declared holy by a declaration of God based on your faith in Jesus Christ because his righteousness now is counted to your, your account. And yet we're to walk worthy of that calling. So our position is we are holy. Our practice is we need to walk in a way that matches our position. And that's an ever-growing experience. Noah was a righteous man. And next it says he was blameless. What does it mean to be blameless? It's interesting because this word in the Greek New Testament is the same word that's used to refer to Christ. Uh, being without blemish. You are not redeemed with gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish. So this blamelessness is blemishlessness. Say that fast. Um, that is something that you are called. That's something that Noah was called. But how can a Christian ever be called blameless because you know you still blow it every day yeah. and yet that's what we're called to in Ephesians chapter 1 God shows us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless that is who you are in Christ and that's the direction you're going now live up to your calling Jude 1, 24 and 25, that great doxology at the end of the book of Jude, that little tiny one-chapter book, has this great doxology. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in his presence blameless. He who began a good work in you is going to finish it. If you're in Christ, if you believe in Christ, He's the one that started you on this journey of faith, and he will complete it if you're in Christ. Make sure that you're in Christ. There's an awful lot of folks running around that call themselves Christians. They have the knowledge in their head, but they've never committed themselves to Christ. And so you must commit yourself to the Lord. Admit that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. And Christ is the only one that fits that job description. Let Christ in 
to clean you up from the inside out, and he will do it. And then it says that Noah walked with God. So here's the practical side of righteousness, that walk. How's your walk? You know, just in an ordinary dictionary, but emphasized in the Bible, a walk is a continuous, continuous action requiring the exertion of effort. You have to put some effort into your sanctification. So concerning your salvation... God did the whole thing. You were born again because you were dead in trespasses and sins. You couldn't work for it because you were dead. But now you're alive in Christ and you can contribute to, in fact, you need to contribute to your sanctification, your growth in godliness. You can't lay in bed and just wait for God to make you this sinlessly perfect person. You're going to have to go through some struggles. Someone has said that sanctification doesn't come without a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Go through trials, and that's how you grow in godliness, by responding the right way to difficulties and so forth, resulting in forward progress. So the Bible makes a lot of statements about how we're to walk. I mean, all these great phrases in your Bible describing on how you are to live it takes effort, some exertion, some forward progress. Noah walked with God, and Christian, you're called to walk with God. You are saved, but now you need to walk with God. So Noah was saved by grace, through faith, just like you. He received favor, grace, that's what grace is, unmerited favor, and he received that by faith in the one true God. Have you made that decision? Have you done that? Noah was blameless, which is, does not mean sinless. Noah was a sinner saved by grace, just like you. We read about these patriarchs in the Bible, and we think, oh, man, these guys were spiritual giants. We're told in the New Testament, they were ordinary people just like you. It says that in James 5, Elijah was an ordinary person just like you. We think of Elijah, whoa, the, the things that God used Elijah to accomplish. And the Bible is quick to remind us, just an ordinary guy. Sinner saved by grace. God can use you in great ways. He delights in making something out of nothing. And by putting his grace on display in you, he wants to make you a trophy of his grace. So we are blameless, not by being sinless. We, we, we try not to sin. We try to obey the Lord. But when we blow it, we man up. We confess our sins. We repent. That means turn around and, and do the opposite. Do the right thing instead of the wrong thing. And God is faithful and just to forgive us. Isn't that great? God is a God of second and third and 70 times 7 chances. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So practical righteousness is the walk. How's your walk with the Lord? And that is the fruit of our positional righteousness, which is received by faith. Okay? That, this is just the gospel way back here in Genesis, and it's all through the Bible. Someone has said you should read the Bible Christologically. That is to say, what is this version or this uh, section of Scripture in Genesis 6 and 7 teaching me about Christ? If you do that, you've read the Bible the right way. Let's look next at the obedience of Noah. So this is, this is the fruit of his faith. By faith, Hebrews 11 says... Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. So God told him there was a flood coming, and, and Noah believed it. We have the written word. God is communicating to his people in this age, in a different way, he spoke audibly at one point in human history. He's not doing that now. He's speaking to you through his written word. 
And oh, Noah would love to have had what you have sitting in your lap right now, the Bible, the whole canon of Scripture. And all you have to do is read it, and you know for certain what God is teaching you and telling you to do today. Read your Bibles. And do what it says. Noah heard the voice of God, and he obeyed. We read the specifications. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. So I went to Lowe's. I went to the self-help <laughs> counter, and I asked them, so where's your gopher wood? And the guy said, the what? Uh, I didn't really do this. <laughs> what is gopher wood? Um, there's a lot of ideas about what gopher wood is. <laughs> Some, some have, don't watch that movie. <laughs> the gopher's cute, but the rest of the movie's um, objectionable. Some, we don't know what gopher wood was. This is the only place this word is used, not only in the Bible, but in Hebrew. So... Maybe it was some tree that existed before the flood, one possibility. Some have guessed, and that's all it is, is a guess, that it was cypress wood, because that's especially durable to water. Um, so there have been a lot of guesses on what gopher wood is. The, the bottom line is we don't know. It was wood. And, and then it says... Uh, that, we are, that they were to cover the, the ark inside and out with pitch. And it's interesting, the word that's, the root of this word um, is, the, the root of the word means covering or atonement. Isn't that neat? The ark itself was to be an atonement. It saved Noah and his family. And there's been no few sermons preached that that is a picture of Christ. That those that are in Christ, just like those that were in the ark, are saved from the wrath to come. God poured His wrath out upon the earth, but those that were in the ark were safe. Those that are in Christ at the end of this age when God pours out His wrath again, not by water, but by fire, they will be safe in Christ. God has not destined you, it says in 1 Thessalonians. He's not destined you for wrath. And then the dimensions of the ark are given in cubits. What on earth is a cubit? Well, uh, a cubit is the distance. Back then, they, they used the distance from the tip of your longest finger to your elbow. Well, that's different for everybody. <laughs> I was just curious. I measured mine. It's 19 and a half inches. Um, so there was a common Hebrew cubit and a royal cubit. And it's believed that the ark was built using the royal cubit according to some old Jewish writings. But again, we don't know. Uh, all the old and ancient people's <laughs> of that day used a cubit, and uh, since everybody had a different length uh, from tip of their finger to the elbow, they made cubit rods, measuring sticks, yard sticks, cubit sticks. This is a cubit. This is what we're going to, this is the, the size uh, of the Pharaoh's forearm or the king of Israel's forearm or whatever but they had a, a standardized cubit that was used. So if you take, it is believed that the cubit that was used here was um, some 20, 21 inches, um, makes the ark very large. It was a wooden vessel, and it had these dimensions. Here's a comparison of it next to modern-day ships. Biggest wooden ship ever made was the ark. And it said, uh, the Lord said, make a first, second, and third decks on the ark. Now, so that brings into the question, 
there is no way that God uh, or that Noah could put every kind of animal on the ark, or two of every kind. And actually, it depends on what you mean by kind, because the Bible defines that very explicitly. What the Bible calls kinds uh, are... Uh, phylum uh, system today would call families. So all those in the dog family have the same number of chromosomes. So we, we went over to the Everages house yesterday for an open house and they have two beautiful German shepherds and they have the same number of chromosomes as my eight pound Morky. <laughs> and I just had to go home and apologize to my dog. It's like, I'm sorry for what man has done to you. <laughs> All this inbreeding to go from a wolf down to a, a gerbil, you know. <laughs> but they all have the same, they, there was only two dogs on the ark. So going through all of that, it is believed that there were probably less than a thousand kinds of animals on the ark. That's 2,000 animals. And the volume of the ark was equivalent to some 570 boxcars. You can put 200 sheep in one boxcar. All right, so what do we learn from Noah's obedience? It's a message that we need to hear today, that faith without works is dead. You can say that you're a Christian, you can say all the right words, but if your lifestyle, if your life doesn't match what you say you believe, you might want to talk to God about that. You might not be a Christian. You can build an airtight biblical case that it, there is no fruit in your life from Christianity. There, there may be no root. There may be no Christianity. It's not that you're saved by the fruit or those good works, but they're the natural overflow of an already saved life. Obedience, good works are the fruit of salvation, not the root. I, I love the way Luther puts it. We're saved by grace through faith alone, but grace that saves is never alone. Okay? So if you have true faith, if you truly believe in the Lord, then your life is changing. You're doing things that please the Lord. To me, that's the biggest miracle of all. I didn't get saved until I was 25. And I know what I was like before Christ. And the fact that God could take that guy and have me up here preaching the gospel to you, I was like, anybody else, Lord? No. No. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work in you to change your wretched heart. Yeah. And then the message of Noah. In 2 Peter 2, 5, it says, God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Isn't that interesting? We're not told that in the book of Genesis, but here in the New Testament, we're told that during that time, during the construction of the ark, and by the way, we didn't talk about it, but the time that they actually had to build the ark was probably less than 75 years. If you look at when the flood started, Noah was 600, then you back that up. It says uh, when the boys were born, he had three sons, and, it's, and the Lord says, take you, your three sons, and their wives, and build an ark. So evidently, they're already alive. They're old enough to have kids, to have wives, rather, um, and his sons and wives inevitably helped him build the ark so that decreases the amount of time that they actually had to, to build the ark down to about 75 years. So what was the message that Noah was giving to the people there that were watching this guy build the biggest boat that has ever been built in the desert? Well, we have a hint because he was called a preacher of righteousness. What was he preaching? Righteousness. Where does righteousness come from? By faith, grace through faith in God. 
And this is the gospel again. Noah was preaching the gospel. He was telling them to repent. Repent from your sins. The Lord says through the prophet Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. Turn away from your sins and live. Atheism is madness. Turn to the one who gave you life. In Him you live and move and exist and have your being. Turn to Christ. Your sin has never done you any good. It's only hurt your earthly relationships and especially your heavenly relationship. Then it says, believe. He was telling the people of the land to believe. The one who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's that faith in God that is reckoned as righteousness. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. You must turn away from your sins and believe in God was Noah's message, and you will be saved. The psalmist's prayer, O oh God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. Pray that over your kids, over your families, over yourself. What was the response of the people in Noah's day? Well, they dismissed the warning and they mocked Noah. So I was thinking about this. How many, what was, how many people responded to Noah's message and climbed on board that ark and got saved? He had zero fruit in his ministry. I don't know if I could do that. If you guys didn't come, I think I would quit. I'm weak, pray for me. Um, no fruit, no response. It's like Jeremiah's ministry, no converts. Now Jesus refers to this. He says that the, the coming of the Son of Man at the end of this age uh, was like the people will be like those that were lived during the time of Noah. They were eating and drinking and marrying, and the flood came and destroyed them all. They just carried on. <laughs> Did you go out and listen to Noah? That guy's nuts. No, I, I listened when he started, and he was so out to lunch, we just stopped listening to him and carried on with life. And not only that, but they, they mocked him. And it says that in, in the epistle to Peter. And again, Peter's referring to the end of this age and comparing it to the end of that uh, pre-flood generation. And he says, mockers will come at the end. They're, they're already here, mocking Christianity and the church and you, Christian, and everything that you hold dear and holy. And it was like that in the days of Noah. And they said, Where, where's the promise of his coming, of, of God's return, or this judgment that you're talking about, Noah? Everything continues on just like it has from the beginning. Nothing has changed. Nothing is going to change. Noah, you're crazy. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. So don't despair. We're living in these last days and you're trying to be a light for Jesus Christ, and it, it seems like people, the more you reach out and try to save them from themselves, the more they scoff and mock. Don't despair. Keep preaching the word. Keep speaking to your friends. So God is long-suffering, but his mercy has an expiration date. It says there that after seven days, after everything was loaded up, all the animals, all the food, Noah and his family, that the door was shut. The door of mercy was shut. 
No more chance to be saved from God's judgment. There is an expiration date on God's mercy. And it is soon coming for this generation. Yeah. Noah withstood the tide of public opinion and he was not dissuaded by unbelief or the ridicule of others. That's hard. Because you are like me. We like to be liked, don't we? We are men pleasers. We like people to like us. So we'll kind of temper any statements about Jesus because we don't want people to think we're crazy. But today, as much as at any time in human history, the church needs men and women who will stand alone like Noah did. Noah was, was one believer in a, in a world, an ocean of unbelief. But he stood firm. The whole world scoffed and mocked and didn't pay attention. But he remained unmoved. What the church needs today is men and women who will stand up for Jesus Christ and be unmoved. I mean, there's, there's so, I mean, the tide of public opinion is like this raging current that's pushing against you. Stand firm, Christian. Stand up for Jesus Christ. The Christian stands alone for Christ through Christ alone. Amen. Not in your own strength. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. But in Christ, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You can stand in your office place, in your neighborhood, in your family for Jesus Christ. But pray and cry out to the Lord for strength and for help to do that, and he will do it. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we, we see the examples that you've placed before us in your word, and we think that we're so much more sophisticated than these ancient worshipers like Noah, and yet, Lord, they're teaching us even all these millennia later an important lesson that we need to follow today, and that is to stand alone for you. Oh, Lord, help us. We are weak. We're easily dissuaded. But we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us by your mighty Holy Spirit working in your people. Strengthen us to stand up for you. We love you, Lord. Increase our love. We do believe in you, Lord. Increase our faith, we pray in Jesus' name.